Sorry. Thanks. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, thank you for attending our Ask a Swala session today. My name is Hawa and I'll be your host for today. Um, today we'll be having Imam Mikdad as our scholar today. So please send in your questions through the Q&A box. And we're just waiting for him to come back on right now so we can start soon.
الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Indeed all the thanks and all the praises are due to Allah and Allah speaks of the blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad and Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, I ask Allah in his mercy to be uh, guide and guard us against all evils I want to uh, first and foremost appreciate um, the heart of Alexi for having me on this platform. I also want to apologize for the um, uh, issues we've had uh, to commencing the, at the commencement of this program because um, you know, sometimes I network will be a bit funny. So, so I want to apologize to us all. I am so sorry about that. I ask Alanis Mercy to accept our waiting for us as what we decide. Um, today we uh, it's question and answer uh, session. I want to quickly point out the fact that I am just a student and um, I stand to be corrected. Um, I, I know or notice that I do have notable scholars on this platform. But venture you notice anything that I that I have said that is incorrect. Please feel free to correct me. To such correction. Um, we are all here on this platform to learn, and I believe that together we can uh, we can uh, we can infuse ourselves, we can galvanize ourselves to learning better about our deen, inshallah. On that note, I want to implore us to um, I think we usually I don't know if um, um I don't know who is answering this program, is this Sister Latifa or who else? Usually we do set the ball rolling by taking a few uh, insights and trying to have some thoughts before we kick start the question and answer session. I don't know if I'm free to do that. Let's go forward. Are we together please? Can I go ahead with a short lecture? Yes sir you can you can you can yes sir okay. now, I want us to consider Surah Nisa, chapter 4, from verse 36 to 37. And here, Allah is advising us about Isan. Incidentally, uh, last Juma, we did um, talk about issues on Isan when I was privileged to lead the Juma in one of our massages. And um, it uh, generated some discussion post Juma, because after the Juma prayer, some brothers um, met me, we had some discussion on. What exactly can we do to, to cope with some exam that are being paid back by what is evil? And besides, what is exam anyway? Exam means goodness in general. And Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was um, talking to the companions, when Jibril came to him and he was advising the companions on, um, um, call it now, when he was asking him, he said, for Akhbirini Ayn al Inform me about Iksan. And Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Al Iksan and Ta'bud Allah ka anna katara. Iksan is that you worship Allah as if you can see him. Because fa in lam takun tarahu, fa innahu yarak. Even though you can't see Allah, Allah can see you. Allah sees you. So here we're saying that Iksan is that which you do primarily because of Allah. And, and it is important for us to critically search our mind here because our minds here because you know that many a times somebody can do something you can give charity you can make efforts quote unquote in the way of Allah you can do anything at all but you know that you have an ulterior motive this is this is warped under some sort of undercoat or undertone although apparently people look at you as working for the dean but you know you're working for either money or fame, or position, or recognition, or authority, or what have you. So extent is that whenever you do something, ask yourself, it, it underscores aniyah here. It underscores our intention. Anything you do in the way of Allah, it must be back with the right intention. Not only must it be done the right way, it must be done the right way with the, with the right niyyah before it can attract reward from Allah. And I'm saying this against the backdrop of the believers who watch out for their ego. Would you watch out for a person? By the time you bring your person into the into the annals of ibadah, 
then that ibadah is bereft of, or could be bereft of the world, except Allah so wills. In other words, whenever you do something, whenever you make effort, whenever you strive in the will of Allah, ask yourself genuinely, am I doing it with the right niyyah? Am I doing it with the right intention? Because if it is not with the right intention, bearer, you don't embark on such an end. Ask Allah to give us guidance. And this is important because like, there's a hadith of Rasulullah Muhammad, وسلم, whereby on the day of Qiyamah, some people will go to Allah. You know, he mentioned three categories of people who will go to Allah and they will ask Allah for reward. And Allah will tell them, you lied. Allah will put, put it back to them. He said, you lied, because you lied. Number one on the list was the person who recite the Quran, right? While on earth, he recite the Quran. Know that for every time and every moment you recite the Quran, it attracts reward. Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that everything that you, every ayah that you recite in the Quran attracts reward, 10 rewards. And Rasulullah emphasized when he was explaining it further, he said, I'm not saying that Alif Lam Mim is 10 rewards, but I say Alif is 10 rewards, Lam is 10 rewards, Mim is 10 rewards. Huge, right? Monumental. But what about the person who recites the Quran in order that people might appreciate him? People might tell him that, hey, yeah, you have a very nice voice. Your voice is nice. <laughs> You're reciting like Sudais or Shuraim or what have you. And the guy feels that, hey, people praise me for this. I, got, I, I, I believe I'm, I'm the best person in town to recite the Quran. And this person flops all this, uh, you know, it, it goes on the part of his ego and he looks at everywhere and anywhere he goes, he must be the person to recite the Quran. This is Shaitan at work because right now the intention has changed. Now, so long as he reads the Quran, people say, Atakbir, mashallah, and he feels so enthused and encouraged. Oh, I got to just read, read more because now that people are praising me, I got to just read more and more and more so that people can say, Atakbir for me. Oh my God. On the day of Kiyama, this person will go to Allah. Guess what Allah will tell him? Allah is going to tell him, Kazab, you lied. Because you, though you, read the, you claim you read the Quran for my sake, but you read the Quran in order that people might praise you. And people have praised you, they have told, they called your name, they called you. And, and, and besides, I need to mention here very quickly. And this is a trend that I have not seen anywhere except in our time. That some of our children who have been to Quran, I mean, um, Quranic memorization schools, and they have been sent there, they memorize the Quran. Now they, they, they put a, a, a kind of a prefix to their names and they say, Hafiz Abdullah Shuaib. Hafiz means memorizer of the Quran, like an insignia. Hey, we're going to ask the question Did you go to the school to memorize the Quran in order that people might be, put Hafiz before your name? The companions of Rasulullah, like Osman Bani Afan, he said, We don't move forward to learn more of the Quran until we have been able to internalize, understood, and apply those ones that we have learned from the Rasul. But today, people parrot the Quran. Somebody even tells me, Nara Mali memorize the Quran, or he can read the Quran. We don't want to be, we don't want to be recite of the Quran who will be the one that will throw away his deen. So what I'm saying is that, yes, reciting the Quran is going to attract the world, but keep in mind, it must be with the right niyyah before it can attract the world with Allah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify attention. Number two is al mawil the person who finances and funds every endeavor in the way of Allah. Is it a da'wah project, is it a masjid project, is it anything? The guy is there pumping money into the way of the deen. But while he does that, he does that because of the fact that people say so, so many things about him, and if he's encouraged with this, so his niyyah changed. And because the niyyah has changed, it denies him of the reward from Allah. On the day of Qiyamah, such a person will go to Allah and say, Ya Allah, I need my reward. And Allah will tell him, hey, man, you lied. Because even though, even though you had done all this, claiming you did it for my sake, you actually did it in order that people might praise you or call you whatever name. I ask Allah, yeah, Allah, please purify our intentions. And people have called you those names. They said you are the financier of the, of the deen of Allah, and somehow they give you posts. And so many Muslim organizations are in this mess today. And with due respect to those who hold this kind of appointment, they call themselves president of Muslim, uh, president of Muslim organizations, uh, chairman of or chairman of Masajid or what have you. And because of this, 
they, 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 they see themselves as controlling the, the din of Allah. It is, it is out of it. It is out of it. And we must get it clear that there is nothing better than the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if you're doing it, you're spending your money because you want to become the Baba Dini, the president, or what of you, or the chairman, fine and good, no problem. No problem. If you will make you the president, what of you, but guard your intention, guard your niya. Ask Allah to purify intention because on the day of Kiyama, such a person who spends his money in the way of Allah with the intention of being praised, even though people might praise him, Allah will return him back to those people who might have praised him. Allah will say, Go to them and get your reward from them. The third person will be the person who uh, is a mujahid, the person who is strive, who strives in the way of Allah. This man who strives in the way of Allah is going to say, hey, any effort, anything, I'm always there, whether it's a, a message or it is a what of you, you see me at the forefront. <laughs> and this brother uh, is so engaged to the extent that we believe that any endeavor that people might have in the way of Allah, he has to be there. On the day of judgment, this brother will go to Allah and will ask Allah for reward. Unfortunately, Allah will tell him, Kadab, you lied. Because even though you claim you did it for my sake, you actually did it in order that people might praise you. And they have praised you, you go back to them and get your rewards from them. May Allah in his mercy purify our intentions. So I need to say for him that we might understand the importance of, um, of, of getting our niya right. And that it is only then that we can call it Iksan. Iksan, one more time, like Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that it's an ta'bud Allah It's to worship Allah as if you can see him. Because even though in Lam Takun Tarahu, even though you can't see Allah in Nahu Yarok, He sees you. So I, I, I want to encourage us to please let us practice Iksan in all that we do. Now, if you go to Quran chapter 4, verses uh, 36 to 30, 37, Allah mentions here some categories of Iksan that we can do to ourselves. Number one is the, it's the key Iksan that you can do as a person to yourself. And this extent is very primary. The greatest, the greatest good you can do to yourself as a believer is to submit your life to Allah and worship none but Him. That's what Allah says: Wa abdullaha wa la Worship Allah and do not ascribe partners unto Him in any way. With this, we have to understand that the ibadah of Allah is important. Worship of Allah is important, but that worship of Allah has to be for the sake of Allah. Ask Allah to purify intention. Number two is, what be the one the day in Be dutiful to your parents. Your parents, you see, the greatest, the greatest thing that a man can do, in fact, Rasulullah uh, underscored this as the shortcuts to Jannah. If you want to have a shortcut to Jannah, it is being dutiful to your parents. I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, the, um, the one of the main reasons why Allah can give you Instant is, uh, is the jabba is because of your duty or, or, or being responsive to the needs of your parents. In the hadith, we have, we have read about three people who were trapped in the cave. One of whom were, was a brother who uh, said and he prayed to Allah using the, the tawassul, using the goodness to the parents as a tawassul, as a means of connecting with Allah. When he said that, Ya Allah. I have a family and in my house live my, lives my parents. In other words, his father and the mother live with him. So he said one day he, he went out and he came back late and he said his own practice in his house is that nobody eats before his father and mother. Before his wife will eat, before his children will eat, the father and the mother must eat first. So he took the food to their room because he came late, he discovered that they had slept. So he said he hold the plate, the bowl of the food or the milk in his hands and he found out that they were they were both fast asleep and he need he didn't want to wake them up he allowed them until they woke up midnight close to the early hours of the morning so they were shocked at this and they, they prayed a lot for him and they appreciated what he did and he said that they yeah, Allah, if i did this that day even though even though he was hungry 
The wife was hungry. The children were hungry. He said, nobody eats in this house before my father and my mother. And for that singular exam, Allah accepted the prayer and the rock shifted. So I'm just trying to connect with this that what we were then exana that being beautiful to our parents is very profound. And the profoundity is to the extent to which I have just mentioned in the hadith. The next point is um, Allah tells us about the close relatives. You know, who are our our al Kurba are your brothers, your sisters, the children of your brother, the children of your sister. They are your ulul kurba. Your father, your father's brother or sister, these are your uncle or your aunts, your mother's brothers or your sister. It's a paternal or the maternal side. Their own children, you know, you have to be good to them. These are your near relatives. So ulul kurba, it has a lot of, um, um, uh, a lot of um, uh, challenge before you can hold on to it, that they will always come with requests. They will always come to you seeking for your help and assistance. <laughs> what as it is possible, be good to them. Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he encourages us to, to be close to our relatives, to be good, goodness to kids and kin is one of the good things that we can do as Muslims. And the next one is waliyatama, the orphans, right? Your orphans are um, your, the people who have no means of assistance or help that could be given to them. <laughs> and I would to make us one of those people that would be good to orphans close to us. And the ayah continues, and I think the time is well spent. I gotta just have a break now that we give them to some question and answers. Then if we discover that we didn't have more questions, I'm gonna continue on from the orphans, being good to the orphans. Uh, but before we start with that, I, I need to mention very quickly that it must be those people who have fathers or mothers. It also means those people who do not have the economic lifeline, right? They don't have means of support. So if the father and the mother might be alive, but they can't help him and they can't take him because economically they can't afford to do some things for this young man or young brother. So if you, if you come across such a person, be good to him as much as it is possible. I ask Allah in his mercy to bless us all and make our task easy for us as we strive in this way. I ask Allah to forgive us our sins, overlook our shortcomings, and count us among the righteous servants before him. In this way, on that note, I want to appreciate the heart of collective. And I want to please remind our audience that I'm just a student. I, I don't know much, and the little I know, I hope you will pardon me. And accept it just a student on your platform today. Ask Allah in his mercy to give us the increased knowledge and understanding of the deen. On that note, we're going to pass here to give room for questions that might be arising going forward. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Sorry, excuse me. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are um? Can we do this together? I have just one question and I already sent um, something in the chat for our audience. So please, today's session isn't just about what our Imam is talking about. We can ask any question, any question at all. There are sometimes in Islam, we have some things that, um, you know, it's not clear to us. So this is an opportunity for us to ask all the questions that we have. If our Imam can answer them, he would, but if he would not, I'm sure it would, um, give us three books or something, suggest so something for us, inshallah. So I have a question, sir. Um, my question is about being consistent with good deeds, especially um, in situations where it's, um, I don't want to say in situations, especially when maybe um, it's kind of difficult to just continue without feeling like, ah, I don't know, it's not like there's a way you can absolutely know that, oh yes, for every single thing that we do, our life is accepting. But I'm just saying like, is there a way to just help us continue to be consistent with our good deeds, not looking left or right, and just keep looking at the goal, which is that's my question. I don't know if I have other questions, but that's like the first question that I have right now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You see, the, the point is that Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was approached by a particular companion and the companion said, I have relatives. 
home, every time I do good to them, they return back with evil. Every time I do something good to them, they do something bad in return. Yeah. I extend hands of fellowship, they, they return it back with, with, with some sort of hatred. Rasulullah, um, he asked Rasulullah just like this question you just raised. He said, what can I do in this circumstance? Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you can continue to be good to them, he said, it is as if you have given them something, something nasty to drink. You know, each time you do good to them and they return back, they return your goodness with something evil, it is as if you have given them something nasty to drink, something unpalatable to drink, right? And he said, you will never, you will always rather, you will always find Allah as your helper against them if you can continue this way. In other words, if we can continue this way, Allah will always assist us. Allah will always support us. Allah will always give us upper hand. Like even when they scheme or make plot against you, you will always be on top because of your goodness. And look, nobody loses anything by being good. You see, I said, Iksan is very primary in our lives. Say good things to people, treat people in a good way, talk to people nicely, do good to them, you know, Talking about the neighbors, for example, I was going to come to that very quickly. Your neighbors do bad things to you. Do good to them in return. You don't lose anything by being good. Sometimes it might seem as if you're so stupid or you don't know anything you're doing, but you just do good. And yes, that's how human beings feel, but that is not the way Allah feels. So I want us to keep doing the good, thing, the good things we've been doing to others because the reward with Allah is very, very massive. So that should be our objective, not what people will give us, or what people will say about us. Allah should be our goal. I ask Allah to meet us all at the point of our needs. I mean, um, so Alhamdulillah, we have one. So sorry, sir. Um, Alhamdulillah, we have one question now. This says, Salaam Alaikum. In praying at the right time and having the appropriate outfit for Salat, which takes precedence. So an appropriate outfit here could be a top and jeans or a short sleeve dress or top, basically covered, but not exactly a buyer or deal, but covered. I don't know if you understood the question, so should I read it again? You can please take the question again. Okay, um, so this question says, in praying at the right time and having the appropriate outfit for Salat, which takes precedence? So in appropriate outfit here could be a top and jeans or a short sleeve dress or top, basically covered, but not exactly a buyer or jilbab covered. Okay, um, praying at the right time is very important. Allah says that in the Salat, uh, that Salat has been prescribed at different, I mean, at specific times. Salat is timed. Invariably, if you don't pray on time, Allah will ask you. And let us keep in mind that uh, a Muslim should live ben al within hope and fear. You should be in awe of the, of the presence of Allah in everything that you do, meaning that you could meet Allah anytime. Okay, fine. Due to certain circumstances or conditions, you might find yourself as a female who uh, is not yet wearing the hijab, right? And you have not yet um, started you know, adorning yourself with the proper dressing as a Muslim lady. Fine, no problem. Now it's time for Salah, what do you do? My encouragement is that as much as it is possible, let us try to apply the rules of hijab. You can't do it for some conditions that Allah knows best. Try to get your, what will make you to be ready for Salat in your handbag anywhere you go. So that each time it's time for Salat, you can get to observe yourself. I have a friend, uh, I, I, I met her at uh, Etro uh, some years back when I traveled to the UK. And she was the one that directed me to the masjid there. When we arrived, and 
I, I discovered that the one she wore initially was not the one she prayed with, which means she was prepared, she pre prepared herself to pray at the right time, despite the challenge she had not wearing the full hijab, right? But then she was conscious of Allah that the Muslim conscious of a deen, right? But just because of one circumstance or the other, she at that point, I don't know now, I pray Allah will continue to strengthen her. She, she was not really ready to wear the hijab, but she had it, she had it in her back. So anywhere she goes, she put it there. So it might be time for salah, she has to pray. So no delay in observing the salah. So if, uh, if the questioner can also glean from this and try to apply it, I think it will be a, good, a way, for, I mean, a good step in the right direction until the time when Allah will make it easy for that person to wear the hijab properly. May Allah make it easy for us. I mean, Ayala, um, how are you? Yeah, over to you. Sorry, um, the next question is, there's a growing trend of abuse, sexual, spiritual, and even financial perpetrated by Muslim men that are outwardly powerless against Muslim women. And it seems, it seems like there's ever any consequence. How do you advise the Ummah to combat, to combat this? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Sorry? Can you please read the question again? Okay. Um, there's a green trend of abuse spiritual, spiritual, and even financial, perpetrated by Muslim men that are outwardly pious. Is that a trend of what? There's a green trend of abuse. Abuse, right? Okay. Sexual, spiritual, and even financial. Okay. Perpetrated by Muslim men that are outwardly pious against Muslim women. And it seems like there's no any con there's no there's ever there's no, there's no consequence. How do you ask the Umar to come back to this? Okay. Um, what I got of the question is that there's a great trend of sexual, spiritual abuse perpetrated by who? I don't I didn't get that part of the question. But besides, I and mean, I'm being that as it may, um, an abuse is an abuse regardless of where it comes from. An abuser it should be condemned, whether spiritual abuse, sexual abuse, or whatever kind of abuse. It is not right for, you know, for example, this is a form of um, hegemony. You know, being a hegemon, you're trying to put someone, launch, I mean, put someone under your sovereignty. And the Muslim doesn't do that because our deen teaches us that the worship of Bodhiya, worship is only for Allah. It's only for the creator, not for the created. In Islam, we do not have hero worship. We don't worship human, we worship Allah. We don't glorify human, we glorify Allah. And with due respect to those people who believe this thing, uh, you know, about two weeks ago, we got uh, the case of um, a particular person, a quote unquote man of God who claimed that, you know, um, angels will credit people's accounts. And so many people went berserk and they tend to believe in what they said, but some people didn't believe, so it made news and became an issue. And honestly, this is laughable, this is ludicrous, that somebody who claimed to be a man of God would deceive people this way. This is outright deception, to say the least, because we know that angels don't credit people's accounts. This, to me, is a spiritual abuse. So irrespective of where, wherever, who, who, whose ox is God, it is a lie, it is a blatant lie, it is a criminal offense, and it must be condemned. So as Muslims, we should understand the teachings of Tawheed. La Raziko, Wala Malik, Wala Mawla, Inna Allah, Rabbul Alameen, Rabbul Ibadah. There is no provider of our needs, there is no king, there is no owner, there is no master that we have, except our creator, Allah the Almighty. So you don't pin your hope on any, on any mortal being, you pin your hope on Allah. Regardless, whoever the person might be, Allah is Allah, human being will always be human being. And that is why in Islam, even when you commit sins against Allah, you don't go around to, co to, to confess to, quote unquote, a man of God. You don't confess to human being. If you did it between you and Allah, you can make your tawbah, and Allah will accept you. 
So that is a, a form of a spiritual abuse. When you human beings put themselves under uh, the control of the, this uh, either subtle or outward control of a fellow human being like themselves. Whoever the person might be, the person is a human being, and you are a human being, and only Allah should be worshipped. And that is the correct teaching of Islam. And Allah knows best. Okay, um, the next question is, Assalamu alaikum. Please, what can you say about a man who insists that the woman feeds the house and carry out some other financial obligations just because he has a major school fees to pay, which might last for another four years and the sister doesn't like it? Well, the point here, okay, I, I'm happy with this question because it underscores the challenge that sometimes we have at the home front. The point is, if you look at the rule on zawaj, the rule on marriage in Islam, it is al milk or, or a cold rod, right? And when Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu was encouraging the youth to get married, he said, Manista Thor Amin Kumaliba Atta Valiata Zawaj. Whoever can afford al ba'a amongst you, what is al ba'a? the capacity to finance at least yourself and your wife, the least. The capacity to pro pro provide food, shelter, and clothing, basically, for yourself and your wife. You know, this is fundamental. Now, for you to put your wife out because you feel you can't meet the financial obligation that you have to go and work, this is outright condemnable, outright, outright condemnable, because you don't put a woman to go work after marriage, because you are the husband, you take responsibility over the woman, but you do it according to your means. If you know that you are not ready for marriage, please don't go near it, because marriage comes with a lot of responsibilities, financial responsibilities, emotional responsibilities, so many responsibilities that you the husband needs to take, take on. And that was why Allah mentioned in Surah Al-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 34, that Al-Rijalu Not the world. Because a man is in charge, has been placed in charge of the home because Allah has given preeminence to one above the other. And because of what they had spent of their wealth. Right now, the man has spent some money, and that was why Allah put him to be in charge of the home. The man provides for the family, that was why Allah placed him in charge of the home. So, you shouldn't pass the box. This is the box you can't pass. The box stops at the table of the husband. So, please, any brother that does this, please seek for counseling from our scholars, from our malams, so that they can guide you on the proper way of approaching this issue. But outright, it is not right for you to ask your wife to go look for means of livelihood while you still claim that you are the husband. This is not correct. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease our fears. Thank you. The next question um, says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My question is, is it right for married for a married man and a married woman to be close friends, especially chatting with the ex without the husband or the wife's knowledge? I'll take the question again. This person, oh, the question says, is it right for a married man and a married woman to be close friends, especially chatting with their exes without the husband or the wife's knowledge? Okay, now there are two things here in this question. For a married man and a married woman to be close as friends, what kind of friendship? That's number one. Number two is to be um, in discussion with your ex. Ex means someone whom you would have married before and maybe for one reason or the other, you didn't get married, you didn't marry the person. That is your ex, right? So the person you are supposed to have been married to should go. Since you didn't marry, you didn't get married to him, he should go. 
right? Let another person, let another person, I mean, you have chosen to marry someone else. So fine and good. You are married to someone else, your ex should go. Ex means former. You can't have two husbands, you know, as it were, as for a, for a woman, and the man can't marry another woman who is already married. So talking or chatting with your ex, this is a pathway to haram. Now, a married man and a married woman can be friends if, it, if the friendship is in the way of Allah. And we must get that very clearly. If there is no friendship that, you know, when your friendship does not lead you to, to, to Allah's, Allah's mercy, when your friendship does not lead you to Jannah, the best of your friends are those who remind you of Allah. And the worst of your friends are those who remind you of your dunya. Of dunya. If you have a friend who's discussion with you early in the morning, late in the evening, anytime, any day, it's dunya, business, money, latest clothes, latest party, latest whatever. You gotta be, you gotta be careful of that friend. Where that friend might lead you to cause of Allah. The best of your friends are those whom who live with you based on Allah. We could have a man and a woman relate as friends, no problem if that relationship is based on the taqwa of Allah and the part of the deen. But if it is something else, then we gotta be careful because nobody, look, look, we need to point out something here. No believer, and I need to mention this very loud and clear, no believer who knows Allah toys with Allah. I want to make it again. No believer who knows Allah toys with Allah. The only people who toy with Allah are those who are al those who are ignorant of Allah. They are ignorant of Allah's great mercy. They are ignorant of Allah's, Allah's great punishment. May Allah save us from his punishment and grant us his mercy. Thank you. I mean, um, we have another question. This question says, what advice would you give or what advice do you have when one keeps forgetting whether they've recited Surah al -Fatha? Sometimes one recites Surah al -Fatha twice in Iraq. So what advice would you give to someone who either forgets? Yeah, to someone who forgets. Yes, I think that's the question. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very good question. Thank you for this question because um, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us there's a particular shaykh, a jinn, or a shaykhan that always throws whisperings into you, doubt. So what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encourages us to do is you base, you base your assumption on al yakin that which is, which, which is uh, more confirmed in your heart. But if you're sure that you have recited the Quran, but doubt now come, you have recited Surah al-Fatiha, but doubt settles in your mind again, have I really recited it? Cancel it out. And Ibn Al Yakin, build your, your position, your salat on the Yakin. Right? The Yakin is that you have recited the Quran. So don't build your, your, your thoughts on that which Shaitan brings to your mind as a doubt. Sometimes Shaitan even brings doubt to make you think that maybe you, you, have, you, have, um, you, have, you have lost your ablution, you know, and it makes you to feel like some kind of flatulence. Whereas in reality, it is not flatulence, it is just whispering of shaitan. So you just ignore it and build your position while, while in salat on al yakin the truth that you have not farted and you have recited your Quran, and that is better in order to have better concentration while in prayer. Okay, um, so we have some um, participants um, on here that, that are raising their hands to ask a question. So, so I wanted to ask, should we allow them ask their questions verbally? Do you mind? Okay, all right. Um, so I would allow the first person to talk. Um, yeah, Nima. Um, are you... Um, my question is if a person is not feeling fine, like a person is not feeling okay, and you want to will repair the solar, or like if there are some times when um you, you might not remember due to the illness or so, you might not remember how many solar you have missed. Do you have to like repair the solar? That's my question. Well, if you missed salat for some days, you can't recall how many of the 
hear me. It's short. For example, like a three, two days, the period is short that you can easily know that, even though you can't recall how many days, but you, you are sure that it's not more than three days. You can repay those salads. You're encouraged to repay those salads. But if the period is enough, may Allah grant us good health, that maybe you have some time. You need that to be off in order that you might be able to. And or even sometimes months that you have not prayed. Then you leave it at that point in time. You start praying at the point when you have consciousness that you can start praying. And this is the, the hukma is based on the fact that Rasulullah Muhammad said, Rufi al kala, Rufi al kalam, and Rufi al kalamu, and that the pen has been lifted for three carries until he remembers. The person who is on to rest and the person who is asleep. Right? So the, this category falls into the category the person who is asleep. Because at the point of the sickness, it is like you are off at that moment. Right? Even when Rasulullah mentioned in the hadith that Al Majnun, the person who is the, the best. At interval, you don't have to pray or you don't have to pay back your salad until you regain your consciousness. Or in the same category, the person who went comatose due to one reason or the other, within an interval, you don't have to pray until you get yourself back complete. Um, so we have one question in the chat box. This question says, does Islam make it mandatory on a man to tell his wife before taking a second wife? Thank you for the question. It is not mandatory on the man to tell his wife before taking a second wife, but it is advisable that the man should carry his wife along, you know, carry the wife along about his intention. Now, some scholars have opined, and it's an opinion, that you may not tell her precisely when, but let her be in the know that you may decide this way. You may choose to get someone else. And the, the moment you get someone else, you are done with it, then you can let, let her know. That look, um, I've told you earlier that I, I wanted to get a sister to join us in the house. I got someone and mashallah, she'll be joining us very soon. So it's pretty, it's pretty nice this way then, for just for the woman to just wake up, you know, like waking up in a dream, and suddenly she just discovered that another woman had entered the house. Please prepare her before that happens, okay? So that she can be in the know of this, uh, of this development. And it's just fair to do that, it's fair. First step, I want to say something. And I was actually holding myself back when you were giving this, um, this um, answer to that question. So when you say that it is not mandatory for him to ask, it puts us in a position like, oh, okay. And when, when she comes, she comes, not near. Aren't you supposed to? Like, am I not? Sorry. <laughs> this question is very sensitive for me because fine, yes, I understand that in the Quran, Allah has allowed Muslim men to marry more than one wife. But then when you now say that it's not, it's not compulsory that he tells me, or he can carry me along, what if it doesn't sit well with me? I have no opinion. I have nothing to say. Whatever it is, it decides. Is it? That's the end. I understand, and you know, I'm being careful with this question because I'm a male gender, and you know, Islam is very sensitive about the female gender. That we should treat them with gentle, with gentleness and subtleties, because it is not as easy as most male might think. It that is the need for the man, number one, before you even think of picking up another sister. Who are you at home? That's a question here. You know, this is a man who, 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 who I mean, abdicates responsibilities. Sometimes he just pass, he walk passes, and sometimes he doesn't care about finances in the house. The quality time he doesn't spend in the house is not homely, you know. And here he just comes and tells you he wants to pick up a second wife. Second wife, how? You know, this is not fair because you have not been, uh, you have not been up and doing as a man, in all its ramifications. You know, not to go so uh, so deep about this. You just wake up from your dreams and just tell the woman. Uh, 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 you know, like my my Yoruba people would say, "Yo bow, 
This is not the way of the sunnah. You need to understand it that, yes, Allah has given you the, the permission, but the first question is, who are you in the house? You know, if you have been, like that's just the, the previous question, you have been telling your wife, okay, pay the bill, do this, let's share it. There is nothing like sharing responsibilities between husband and wife in Islam. Your husband's responsibility is to provide for the wife to the best of his ability, according to his means. And Islam does not encourage women to, to, um, to kind of goad the man. You don't go to the, your husband to dip his hands into haram because you want to make X, Y, Z class, you want to get the latest, everything. Then your wife, is, your husband becomes a thief. It steals public property, and you are not correct. So if your husband has been up and doing, and mashallah, you know, and we need sincerity to work here. You know that your husband is responsible. You know he has been trying his best in the family. And you know there is a, another sister outside who needs a man like him. Don't deny that sister of that opportunity of being a wife, a co-wife, so that both of you can have the rahmah of Allah in the same home, under the same roof. The mistake we make, and then to point out this, and a lot of Muslim sisters has fallen into this ebb. Wallahi, only Allah can forgive some sisters. And I'm saying this with all sense of humility. That some sisters have made life so difficult for their husband to the extent that they want to just make him make his life a kind of a roller coaster thing that he should never think of getting another wife. It's not fair. It's not right. We should fear Allah in everything that we do, right? Don't push him to haram and when he's doing his beat, don't say he's not doing anything at all. I think both parties should fear Allah. The husband should fear Allah, the wife should fear Allah. The life on earth is transitory. Let us get it clear. Life on earth is transitory. Nobody is here on earth to stay perpetually. So don't let us see dunya as the ultimate of our lives. Let us see akhirah. No matter how much you want to purify your life, you want to get the best of it. Hey, hey, hey. This is your parlor. This is your house. This is your room. You want to live in affluence. And other people are suffering outside, man. Let other sisters come and have a bit of the enjoyment you've been having with your husband if you have been enjoying your husband. And of course, we should fear Allah not to make life difficult for ourselves. Remember, the, 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 the Jannah is the ultimate. Our Akhirah is the ultimate. And I'm saying this honestly, not because I'm speaking as an angel, but because this is just the truth. The truth of the matter is that we should not fall into the trap of materialism. That you have materially conscious acquisition of world, wealth, wealth. To the extent that you want your husband to keep acquiring things and you want to just deny other people from benefiting from what the Rahman Allah has given to you. Honestly, it is not fair. It is not fair. May Allah in his mercy purify our intention and give us the exam. Exam, just that we talked about, it, 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 it comes in here. I mean, I mean, I mean. Um, so we've had a couple of questions in the chat. I'll just take them now. This question says, Assalamu alaikum, please. I want to know if it's haram for a man or a woman to get married to a Christian or let him or her to continue as a Christian. A man or a woman, I think we need to yes. get it clear. For a man to marry a Christian or a Jew is halal, is permissible. Surah Al Ma'ida, chapter 5. Verse 3, Allah mentions it. So we need to get that clear. Number two is that for a woman to marry a Christian is not permissible. And it's clear, and I will explain. Because Islam allows you as a man to marry a Christian and allows the woman to practice her Christianity under your roof. This is not by wish. This is not a man might decide, okay, decide, okay, I allow you. This is by law. Allah makes it a law that you can even... As a Christian wife, you can challenge your husband in, in, in the court of law or even in Sharia court that the Quran allows me to practice my Christianity under his roof, yet it's denying me of what Allah says. But not the other way around. I don't know much of the Bible, but I don't think the Bible allows a Muslim woman to, by law now, not because not that the, the husband says, okay, you can do it. No, by law that a, a Muslim woman who is married to a Christian husband can challenge the husband in the court of law or any Christian court or what have you, to say that the Bible allows me to practice my Islam under its roof? No, it doesn't exist anywhere. 
So Allah makes it haram because of some of this provision amongst others, which are uh, we take our time. And besides, in Quran chapter 2, Surah to the Baqarah, verse 221, Allah says, do not marry the Mushrikat, right? Those people who aspire partners unto Allah, do not marry them. This, this is in, 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 with due respect to our Christian colleagues, this is in, in view of the fact that Christians today worship Jesus as God. And this is, this is the shirk, right? They call Jesus' name more than they call God's name. And we know this is shirk. It's not right. Would you want to sell your Islam away and sell your Jannah away because of dunya? I bet you it's better, to be, it's better for you, that Muslim sister, to be the third or, or second or third or fourth wife, right? With a Muslim man than being the only woman with a Christian husband. And I want to I want to say kudos to a particular sister whom uh, I heard of her case some years back. They said I better remain single for life than marrying a non-Muslim. I heard this on a platform and I, I was quite impressed. She said, I better remain a single for my life, no husband, and make Jannah than marry a non-Muslim husband. So we should build our faith to this extent of having tawakkul in Allah. I ask Allah to purify intentions, inshallah. I mean, Ayala, but uh, I want to ask like I want to ask like a um, like another question. It's it's still it's still about this um marine Christian or Muslim. So like I, I've heard, I've seen that I've seen situations where Nella forgive me if I'm saying the wrong thing, where a sister is with a Muslim brother and he does treat her well. And this is not even a story. I know this person, this person is like my family member. But they've been with a couple of Muslims and they, they, they were not well or properly treated by the so-called, by these Muslim men. And she met a Christian guy and to her, she's doing okay. He's, the guy treats her well. He carries her like egg. I mean, it's just like she feels at peace with a Christian person that she has ever felt with the amount of Muslim guys she has been with. So like, I don't know, like in that kind of situation, like how, how is she supposed to do it? And then I heard, I hear you say that you had a sister that said she would rather be the third, fourth or second, third or fourth wife with a Muslim and make Jannah. Does it mean that if you're not a Muslim, if you're not married to a Muslim man, you would not make Jannah? Okay, uh, fine. Um, let me give an example of Umu Sulaim, Sahla. Umu Sulaim, when Abu Talha approached, approached uh, her for marriage, Abu Umu Sulaim said that, look, you are, a, you are a wealthy man, you have everything, and an average woman will not want to reject an offer coming from someone like you. But then, I cannot marry you. So look at Muslim, look at Islam. Say, I can't marry you because you are not a Muslim. And if you, my only dowry from you is if you can become a Muslim sincerely and I see you practice Islam, that will be my dowry. I will not collect anything from you. So Umu Sulaim's dowry from her husband was Islam. So we're not talking about dunya here. We're talking about akhirah. Okay, fine. You enjoyed your life. You enjoyed everything. You had a nice time. Aren't you going to die? Aren't you thinking about your akhirah? Aren't you thinking about you dying with kalima? Aren't you thinking about ibadah of Allah? But to al hayat al dunya. You want to give preference to earthly life? Well, akhirah to khairun wa apiko. Whereas the akhirah is better. Hey, hey, hey. I don't understand here. I think we should be talking about faith and how we can infuse, galvanize ourselves to greater heights. Not talking about enjoyment of this dunya is small. Khalil, mata. It's just small. Because Allah can call us back to himself at any point in time. And you forget about any hundred, one thousand years of enjoyment of him. If you ever have that kind of opportunity. Yes, I know there could be instances where you, and this is trial of Allah. It's a trial. It could be trial of Allah. And of course, no thanks. And I still, I keep saying this. I don't like 
because uh, maybe because of the position Allah has placed me, I've heard a lot. I've heard a lot about brothers. Not thanks to you, you. I'm talking about you, that Muslim brother who becomes something else, maltreating our Muslim sisters. Not thanks to you. It's not good for a man to maltreat a Muslim. I mean, before she became your wife, she first and foremost she is your Muslim sister. Now she's additional responsibility. She's not your, your wife. You have two responsibilities. She's your wife. She's your Muslim sister. Even if you don't treat her because maybe she's not a good wife, treat her because of her Islam. And the only thing that I think is, is fundamental is if a woman commits heinous crime in the deen, then you can let her go. And this is my position. A sister commits heinous crime that Allah has outright, for, out, I mean, forbidden outright, then you don't consider her for anything. Even if she's beautiful, even if she's wealthy, even if she's this, she's that, the moment she goes against fundamentally what Allah has said, don't do this. Like a Muslim sister commits zina, let her go. She steals, let her go. She does something nasty that Allah has forbidden, let her go for the sake of Allah. But not flimsy excuses and not just maltreating sisters, just in the name of whatever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. Amin. Um, so we have another question. This one says, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Can a Muslim observe his salat in a hotel that is patronized by righteous and unrighteous people? Wow, yes, this question. Can a Muslim observe his salat in, an hotel, in a hotel? That is patronized by both righteous and unrighteous people. I, well, I can't remember how many salads I've observed in hotels. <laughs> and I, I know I've stayed in hotels, Nigeria, abroad, so many places. Yeah. I, well, I don't know who stayed there before I, 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 I checked in. Mm -hmm. um, I feel it, my, my, the beautiful thing about me is that I never travel without my prayer mat, my musalla. Yeah. If I travel to countries where, which is non Muslim countries, and I've been to some countries, where you hardly find massage, my masjid is my, my musalla, right? So whether the person, the hotel was stayed in where you have some ashewus or whatever, that's their, that's their business. Your business is your business, right? So you pray anywhere. That's what Surah I said. Every part of the earth is a masjid for you. So you can pray there. Me, I have a follow-up question. You were saying now, sir, that um, that you always travel with your um, prayer mat. I have been in situations where I probably didn't think that I was probably going to really stay out or or stay for a while in those kind of places, and I did not have. All I did was just dust and make sure that the place that I was going to pray is not dusty or dirty or has anything that is unlawful. And then I found. They keep that with my phone, and then I pray. Am I safe? Yes, you are, because the way wherever you pray is your earth, is your earth. So I'm only giving myself as an example that I, I will being conscious of the salat, that salat can catch up with you anywhere. So just spread your prayer mat, face the Kibla direction, and if you can't have your prayer mat, pray on the tiles or the rock there. If you are sure that the place is okay, then you can pray there. And if you're in doubt, spread anything, even your kerchief or whatever, you spread it on the on the on the floor, and then you can pray there. It's no problem. All right, so we have this really um, amazing question by my sister. This says, "Salam alaikum." If after marriage, the couple is unable to live together, long distance relationship doing due to unforeseen circumstances. Is it haram or impermissible? Some people are of the opinion that the couple is trying. The couple is trying Allah, that they are trying to be comfortable instead of accepting their faith and live together. A backstory. So the groom works outside the country and the and the certain someone is of the opinion that he can get a job within the country to be with his wife. So the question says, if after marriage, the couple is unseen, unable to live together, long distance relationship, due to unforeseen circumstances, is it haram or impermissible? I love this question. Let's, let's get something clear here, and we need to get it. I'm a student of Sharia, and I think 
it is not right for anyone to pronounce anything haram unless Allah or Rasulullah makes it haram. If it's not made haram by Quran and the Sunnah or had authentic hadith, then we can't say it is haram. So I'm saying it's against the backdrop of the question. If they got married, the circumstance beyond their control made them to live separate, I mean, in separate uh, uh, maybe countries, right? This is a darura here. It's necessity. And necessity makes it, even if it was, even if such things were haram, it makes it permissible, right? So the couples that got married and because of job requirement or what have you, they have one has to stay in Nigeria, the other in Ghana. Then they should just try to look for ways of connecting, you know, connecting with themselves as much as it is possible. Although it is challenging, I must say it, but it doesn't make the relationship to be haram. It doesn't make it haram under no circumstance. So the only thing I want to encourage them is let them get to connect themselves as much as it is possible so that in, uh, the novel waters of that moment. It's momentary. It's an impasse. It will be over. The fact that today they're living in different countries, tomorrow, inshallah, Allah will provide for them and they will live together. Because I know the desire of the husband and the wife is to live together. And if I can give my example, myself as an example, my job requirement, because of the kind of job I do, is a turnaround. My job is a turnaround by nature. I hardly stay at home. So if moments I have to travel up and down, posted here and go there, and <laughs> what are you talking about here? It's not around because I have to be in other states. And more often than not, I have so many of my colleagues who are not saying where the family is for months or years. Yet they still look for ways of connecting with themselves. So it doesn't make it haram under any circumstance. And Allah knows this. Um, so right now we don't have any questions, although we we'll appreciate more questions from our audience, but I have a question. Yeah. Um, so my question is on istihara. So if you're doing istihara for see a choice in a partner, a future partner, I for one. I'm always, maybe not always, but like I always just ask myself, or the impression I have of Easter is, oh, okay, so you're doing it for Allah to guide you. But then it's like, I'm particularly looking for like a sign or like something, maybe a dream, maybe something, but then I don't see anything. So then I'm like, should I keep waiting? Should I keep waiting? And then before I know it, doubts or some sort of thing starts setting in, and then I'm forced to do another one. And then I still don't see anything. So I spoke to like my mom, and then she's like, maybe you might not see like a sign per se, maybe something you can remember or something you see in your dream could be maybe like distance between you and that person or some sort of things. But I want to ask you because you're in like maybe a better place to explain to me. Are we supposed to see a sign? And like when we do the ECR prayer, what are we supposed to do? Just I know that we're supposed to of course allow Allah to do his best for us, but like, it just confuses me sometimes, like, what am I waiting for, a sign? Or what exactly? Okay, fine. Um, Istikhara is like it goes, is to seek for guidance from Allah. And if you look at the dua itself, you're asking Allah for guidance, you're asking Allah for direction in that which you want to do. Okay, now, should you see a dream? Should you see a sign? And the answer is no. The aim is that Allah will guide your heart to that which is the best for you, and Allah will make that which is the best for you to come at the end of the day. So istihara is continuous until the marriage is done. You don't stop istihara until you, you are married. That even if they say your marriage is tomorrow, do istihara today. As in your nikah is tomorrow, do istihara today. Still ask Allah for guidance because Allah knows. Within the twinkle of an eye, Allah can bring something else that will make you to, to understand that this may not be the right wife or this may not be the right husband for you. And honestly, honestly, if you do istikhara sincerely, Allah will guide you. Sincerely, Allah will guide you. I can tell you for free. Allah will guide you. All right, sir. Um, but it was just funny when you said that even if your wedding is tomorrow, you should still do istikhara to be like, what happens if, okay, Allah just changes your heart? Oh, well, I guess we'll have to call off the wedding then. You, you look, is it not better to cancel a relationship yeah. that cancels? 
Yeah. Suppose in a relationship, you are, you, are, you are about getting wedded. You're not wedded, right? Now, yeah. if you are injured and it becomes a huge problem, it becomes even more, more difficult, right? Yeah. So Allah will guide you just to your istikhara till the end, till the D day. Then you now leave your fears in the house of Allah. Mm. Okay. Um, so we have one question in the Q and A box. It says, "Is it permissible for them, them in this case would be maybe the man and the woman, to do marriage contract on the side of the husband to avoid committing zina?" Oh, them. I'm sure this person is probably the person that asked the question about distance, distance. The the couples that are in different parts of the world. So, is it permissible for them to do marriage contract on the side of the husband so that? to avoid committing zina. Contracting, well, I don't understand marriage contract here. I need to, I need to understand. It. Okay, I don't know if I should interpret it the way I think this question is directed to us. So maybe the person is saying, like, maybe they are not married yet, but they are. Oh, I think they are married. I think the question says they are married. So, uh, like, maybe can we do something written that says, okay, well, because we are in two different countries, let's write something down that says you must not do this. So. To avoid committing in I guess. Like, let's just put something down so that when you remember that, okay, we have something written down, you would not, I think it's just like trust, so as so that the other person can trust the other person that, oh, okay, this will happen, this will happen. That's, the, the point is that marriage contracts, I don't know, um, and I know no, nikah, nikah with muta is haram, so if it's haram, you don't do it. Marriage contracts, I don't understand that is you you contract you make it the contractual arrangement that between you and the woman for some time that maybe like a year or a month that you broke up break up the marriage. Honestly, this is not a sunnatic marriage. It's not sunna here. If it is sunna, it is for life. Marriage is you get married to someone for life. Okay, nobody gets married to someone. Okay, we're going to stay together for two years, three years, or one month, two months, three months. The sooner does not allow that to happen. I don't know if I'm making it. Uh, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like I've heard that marriage contract is I, I don't know if it is haram. I'll be sorry, I don't know if it is halal, but I, I I'm not sure if it's haram. Why do I say it? Because I hear that like people, or maybe the marriage contract that I'm talking about is okay, so before we get married. We say that okay, like I'm not so sure. I hear that people do marriage contracts. Okay, this is what we agree to. If there is this, this is what will happen. So, are you saying now? That it's no, no. Maybe I should get the definition of what you mean by marriage contract. What is marriage contract? Maybe I should get it right. It's a contract, something that is binding you and the other. Right. In Islam, marriage is a contract. But what kind of contract? It's a contract for life. It is not contract that is time bound. That's what I'm trying to explain now. You can say you can have settlement, like okay, for example, we can have discussion around it. We have we will have this, we won't have this. You can have contract that okay, the two of us we are still in school. We can have a contract, we won't begin to have children until after five years when we finish school. You know, we can have a contract, okay, we're gonna do this, but every contract must be in line. With the Sharia. Everything you say, everything you do must be in line with what Allah says. What this, is, this, is, this is because we are Muslims. You know, if you are not Muslim, we are talking to some other people, we can say, okay, these are not Muslims. But because we are Muslims, it has to be done in the way of the Sunnah. That makes it Islamic, right? So yes. everything must be backed up with what Allah wants, what Rasulullah has taught us to do. Okay. All right. So I, I guess I'll just leave it as, as where, you, where you said, because let me just leave it as that. So we have another question um, in the chat box that says, how far can a man go Islamically to please his first wife who is not happy that he married his second wife? Oh, wow. To educate the first wife who is not happy that the husband married the second wife, right? Yes, how far can a man go Islamically to please his first wife who is not happy that he married the second wife? 
<laughs> okay, how far can it please the white? No, no, no. You don't have to dip your hands into things that are not halal. You know, um, in Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, encouraged us on on, on um, good nature, good character. You know, it should be good in all in all the situations as much as it is possible. Now, you're trying to please your wife, making things easy for her, buy gifts for her, uh, do some additional things. You know, just try to uh, um, um, cool her down. You know, but it has to be within the limit of what you can afford. And I keep saying this. I don't want brothers, and I've had cases of brothers who literally are thieves. When I say thieves, I mean, it could be highway robbery, it could be pen robbery, it could be whatever kind of robbery. Hey, you will account for it before Allah. That's my fear now. So if in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in a bit to please your wife, you, in, you are involved in haram, you say Allah will understand. Hey, no, no, you should understand first before you say Allah will understand. <laughs> you don't dip your hands into haram because you want you think Allah should understand. But please your wife to the best of your ability. And Allah sees your mind. That you have tried your best. But keep in mind, it doesn't take you away from being in charge of your family. It doesn't take you to be uh, away from the fact that you are in charge of your home. Marry another wife, you didn't commit any crime by so doing anyway, because you have done that which is sonatic. And you don't have to look at your wife and make it haram. Don't make haram for you, for yourself, what Allah has made halal for you. He didn't do that. All right, sir. So to draw us back just a little, I just went online to read up like about marriage contracts and so i'm seeing something here that says the inclusion of stipulations in marriage contracts is discussed by many muslims today as the best way to protect women's rights within marriages and this says that the first the husband's first duty is to pay an agreed marriage to his wife the property which can like i think this is just saying that the marriage contract that we're talking about is just to write what the woman's right is in the marriage or what both of them what they have right upon and where if one person is not doing this this is what will happen i think that is what that marriage contract that i'm talking about is saying you see you see my my my, my sister honestly i want us to be careful the best we can write is when it is according i'm not i'm not against writing down anything but i think the greatest thing that can guide us regardless of whatever you write is taqwa of allah honestly and I say it with all sense of humility. The greatest thing that can guide your husband and the wife is the fear of Allah. Because the man who, who does not respect Allah, whom he cannot see, will not respect the wife when the wife is not there. The woman who does not respect Allah, whom, he cannot, whom she cannot see, will not respect the husband when he's not there. Is it not to turn your back? Well, turn your back, she stops it. Or he stops it. Right? So but with the fear of Allah, we will be guided aright. That's my position. If you have the fear of Allah, Allah will ease your fears. If you have the fear of Allah, Allah will open the way for you. So don't, I don't want us to make it too like a rocket science that you, okay, you have to write down every detail so that if you, if you go fear, I got to pick you up your hair. You know? You're making it like a roller coaster thing, man. Relax. Let's be free with ourselves. The husband is in charge of the wife, and the wife is in charge of the home. And both of them should work together to make a happy home for themselves and by themselves. This is what I expect us to do, honestly. I understand you perfectly, sir, but I was tempted to say how many men do actually have the taqwa of Allah. I know that, of course, we have men that have Allah's the piety of Allah in their hearts, but I think it, it just boils down to say that a lot of times it's not what you say before you enter that you see once you've got. I'm not married, and I can't say categorically that ah, okay, yes, so um, every man is the same. I hate to generalize, I feel like may Allah just grant us the best that that's like always my prayer, but it's just as he said, it's just to protect us as women. It is at this point that we need to ask. 
is very, very powerful. Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, a dua who says for the Muslim. Dua is a sword of the Muslim. Whether for the man or for the woman. And, and I, don't, I don't want us to be making chauvinistic here. Because it, 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 it cuts across both edges. It affects the men, it affects the women. There are some men, and because of, uh, of the fact that I interact with a lot of brothers, there are some brothers who today are regretting marrying some sisters. Today, they're living in hell because they claim they have married a Muslim sister in hijab, not knowing that underneath the big hijab, that was hell, that was Jahannam, that was evil. And there's some, so, so it's both sides, right? So we just do out to Allah, we need to pray to Allah to have mercy on us. And that is just my, my appeal. I mean, I say a big I mean for myself and for all the sisters and even all the brothers down here. I mean, I mean, I mean. Um, this question says, Salaamu Alaikum, sir. May Allah, may Almighty Allah increase you in knowledge. As you said that the Christians are Mushrikuns because they worship Jesus. Now, what's the verdict? Can you hear me, sir? May Allah, oh, sorry. As you said that Christians are Mushrikun because they worship Jesus. Now, what's the verdict for people who pray for Christians when they die, which Allah forbids? In Quran 9, verse 113. What's the verdict for people who pray for Christians when they die, which Allah forbids in Quran 9, verse 113? Hmm. The truth of the matter is that even if the person who does it is in Saudi Arabia or is the Imam of, uh, of Haram Masjid, it doesn't make it halal anyway, whatever, whatever Allah has made haram. What is haram is clear. What is halal is clear. If Allah says don't do something, you go ahead and do it, then you have done what is haram. So if, if you know the right thing to do, do it. If you know that what you're doing is wrong, tap it. Okay? And, I'm, and I appreciate the, the ayah that our either brother or sister have pointed us to, that we don't have to uh, pray to, for those people whom we know died in the state of uh, uh, shirk with Allah. And, um, um, and you record the case of Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he prayed for, he, he asked Allah to pray for his uncle and Allah told him no. And it's in this context, uh, uh, Allah revealed this ayah, Right? So you don't pray for them because you know that they died without faith in Allah. So just leave their judgment to Allah. Apparently, you don't say, you don't say as a Muslim that X, Y, Z is going to hell. I don't, you don't have the right to say that. But at the same time, you don't make, you don't make dua to, to Allah that, oh, Allah put X, Y, Z in Jannah when you know that the person died not in the state of Islam. You just leave it to Allah. Leave it. All right, sir. So, um, I have a question. Sorry, I'm so sorry, Awa. You, you take um, the one that we have. I have a question. And it's even... It's me saying, this is, this should, I'm sure this is like a no judgmental zone, but like sometimes I find myself just say Jesus sometimes, like exclamation. Like it's just maybe because I went to maybe, I, I, I don't want to give myself any excuse, but it's maybe because I went to Christian primary school, secondary school, and then free mixing with like Muslims and Christians. Of course, there are sometimes that, of course, I say maybe subhanAllah, but sometimes I find myself say Jesus. I want to clarify, is that sure? Does it mean that I'm associating partners with Allah by shouting Jesus? Like out of maybe I'm ex I'm exclaiming or it just comes out. Is that sure? Like I'm struggling with that part. If it's an advertent, then it's no problem. You know, inadvertently, if you say it, it's not coming from your mind. But if it's something you say deliberate from your mind, it's sure. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. If something conscious, they say unconsciously that you don't intend it, then you don't have to say, you don't have any blame on that. Just be careful of, you know, um, 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 the thought that across your mind, what you try to engage your mind in, what you see, what you watch, you know, when you watch too much of Nigerian movies, you get, you know, 
touch too much of Nigeria movies or this, um, you can call it, they call it Nollywood or Bollywood or whatever. Would. So you might see yourself falling into this category or those who see Mami Water is half human being, half fish. Anybody that watch movie will see, will believe this junk. It's gonna be you can't see any Mami Water that is half human being, half, half fish anywhere under the north, underneath the earth. But when you watch movies, you watch film, you see it. So you need to be careful of what you internalize. That's just my advice. All right, sir. Over to you, Hawa. Um, okay, so the last question is, how can our young brothers, when there are little to no opportunity for them to meet their opposite sex? I didn't get a question. Um, it says, can you hear me? The question is, how can our young ladies meet their Muslim brothers where when there are no little or when when there are little or no opportunities for them to meet their opposite sex? Yeah, it, uh, it, I, I like this question because um I, I had a I had a last week, and I discussed something that uh, borders on this um, aspect, masjid system. You know, Muslims, Muslims, Muslims talk. May Allah return us back to the deen in a good way. Many Muslims have turned the masjid to ritual houses. When I say ritual houses, the place you go to only to hit your head, like non-Muslim says, hit your head on the ground, pa, 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 and salam alaikum, salam alaikum, and you just get out. The masjid is not, uh, is not the hub of the Muslims, at least in Nigeria. Because, mashallah, alhamdulillah, if I've not been opportune to go to other countries, I might think this is all that Islam is, uh, I mean, this is what Islam is all about. If any Muslim stays in Nigeria, lives in Nigeria, and dies in Nigeria, I've not seen Muslim in other parts of the world, you would think Islam is just Nigeria. And it's sad the way Muslims in Nigeria practice Islam. We turn the mosque to like ritual house. We push him on the imam under the sovereignty of what about chairman, uh, uh, Baba Dini, uh, president. We don't even practice what the Sunnah says in, in our mosque, not outside the mosque, in the mosque. And that is why we want our business with the mosque is just to go and pray and we go back home and sleep. It is that, it is this kind of mosque that would not create avenues, rooms. For young stars to interact in a, in, a, in a strictly halal environment where they can meet, number one. Number two, I don't know, and I stand to be corrected. Like I told you, I'm a student of knowledge, and I want our sheikh in this on this platform to please correct me. I have not seen anywhere in the Sunnah which says that the women in the mosque should be locked up, locked down in a very unkempt, smelly, sometimes dirty. You call it the women praying area which the men never take care of. The men in the worst place, if you want to look at the worst place in the mass, so, so many massages, look at the women's side. They lock them up, lock them down, and then they say they should pray with TV. And I ask a question, can a woman watch TV while praying? They said, no, they should just look at the imam on the TV. And they brought their so-called technology in the, in the, in the salat. And it, 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 the question is, can you pray with TV? The rule of Salat January is that you should see the person that sees the person that sees the person that sees the Imam. But in Nigeria, we lock our women up and down. Right? And we, we, we tell that when even when the Imam goes for Sajida to uh, Sajida to uh, Tilawa, maybe you read the particular portion in the Quran, you have to do sujood. The women who hear Allah who Akbar, they go for Ruku. Where are the men in the male side, they go for sujood. The women are expecting semi Allah Liman Hamida from the Imam. They hear another Allah Akbar, they are confused. This is a, this is part of what affects even mid selection in a halal Islamic environment. It is sad. And this is, I'm saying it honestly, it saddens my heart. It saddens my heart that we're raising our children. And most of, I'm not saying all, because I, I know I've, I've had some of my, my, my respected for you. And I've interacted with them that they practice what the sunnah is. But most 99% of the massages in Nigeria, honestly, they're just something else. 
So that is what will affect that our children will not have the space to interact or even see themselves in a halal environment or the milk. I'm a father and I want my daughter to marry or my son to marry a Muslim who is good. We don't even see them. They don't come to the masjid. The masjid is not encouraged. They don't have interaction, no program, just salat and salat alone. No interaction, no adkar, no lectures, no hala, halakot or what have you. What kind of Islam is this? And I, I, I request if our, our, our shayuk are on this platform, please let us bring up, bring up this discussion at a higher level, not at a student level like myself, at a higher level of, of the ulama like you, so we can uh, um, um, go to the nitty gritty of these things and get things right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. I mean, um, I just want to just like make a commentary. I don't know if it will happen, but sometimes I even see like some people even try and host like gatherings for mostly male and females to not interact in, in a haram way, in a halal way. But you still find like maybe the sisters or even the brothers being proving difficult. They don't want to meet sisters there because they are scared that what if she's pretending, but we'd rather go out there where everybody's allowed to behave in, I don't know, in an Islamic manner, and then they'd rather meet them there. I don't know, like, why, why does that happen? There's a reason why organizations or people even like organize these things for us to meet. And if Allah will, something develops, it doesn't even have to be like relationships, to be even friendship or even business opportunities or whatever. But then they rather, I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking about the brothers now, they rather go to, go outside where most, where you don't even know how good or not to say that these programs will depict that ah, this sister is the best sister or ever but i mean that's the reason why these programs are organized i, I, I was just adding a commentary see um uh, my sister the truth of the matter is that many things we get wrong but of course we can't come we can't um conclude or finish up with this discussion on this platform looking at the time frame but having said that the truth of the matter is that if you look at what rasulullah had said about selection of mates he said, if you see someone that you like, go to the family. If you see someone, you see a lady that you like to marry, then go to the family. Going to the family means what? It means you are showing a sign of seriousness. Sometimes you could even go to your own family, your wali, and your wali could go to the wali of that person. You can go to the wali of that person yourself. They, they, they have any of, and don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about the toasting galore that, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about opportunity for you to say, okay, I've seen some social and social person do your investigation, go to the family and make inquiries. Seek for the hands of the person in marriage in a halal way. And that is just the right thing for us to do as Muslims. But it's a whole lot of topic in and, in, in, in and out of itself. I ask Allah to make it easy for us to, maybe some of us who are better than myself, and bring up this discussion on another platform so that we can educate the Ummah um, on this manner of um, the Islamic approach, the proper Islamic approach on how to get um, mar married. And um, well, 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 maybe one of the reasons why I'm thinking that I might be something that has to do with marriage. I feel a lot about um, brothers and experience, sisters experience on this marital issues. And, uh, I think once we get right up in issue, inshallah, inshallah, we won't fall into wrong hands, inshallah. I mean, um, so there's this little question here that says, a man observes the solat in front of TV and claims it does not disturb him. Is it possible? Can you say it again? A man observes the solat in front of a TV and claims it does not disturb him. Is it possible? I don't think it is right. I don't want to call it haram, but it's not right for a man or a woman to observe salat looking at the TV. You know why? There is no connect. There is no connection between the man and the imam in any way. What happens if TV goes off? The imam might say never cannot take light. Okay, what happens if something happens to the TV or network? Not in your house, but in the station. What happens if there is any issue that you can't even see the imam or hear him again? Your salat is lost. And besides, 
that would have uh, 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 countered the rules of Salat that you must see the Imam or see the person that sees the person that sees the person that sees the Imam. The chain has to be there, right? The chain has to be there. So I think TV, praying with TV is out of the question. And it's, I don't think it is right. Howard, um, <clears throat> Howard, over to you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Mom and Dad, for the very good session. Um, unfortunately, we'll have to leave now because it's almost my group. But um, I'd like to thank our participants for today um, for tuning in for the Q&A um, session and also asking questions, very interesting questions. Um, if you can please make like a dua to close off this session, that would be great. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate uh, the organizers of this um, discussion today. I ask Allah to bless you, to bless us all, and accept a little effort in his way as worthy in his sight. I ask Allah to um, reward us for you know, um, using this kind of platform to educate Muslims and encourage us in the path of our deen. And honestly, I must commend the Sahara Collective for this uh, laudable effort, uh, spending your time, spending money, spending everything, all in the path of Allah for the sake of Islam. And you know, so may Allah reward you with the best of the world. You go forth and the best of the world is out there. To all those who, uh, who participate in this uh, uh, program today, ask Allah to bless us all the time we have spent together. I ask Allah to bless us. I ask Allah to make this as a means of uplifting our demand, our faith in Him. I ask Allah to continue to purify our intentions and make whatever we do to be sincerely, sincerely for His sake. And having done all this, but at the end of the day, I ask Allah to grant us Jannah. I ask Allah to grant us Jannah and protect us from Jahannam. May Allah protect us from going to Hawaii. May Allah give us the best in this world, the best in our grave, and the best in the day of judgment. And I, I, I'm not going to end this session without praying for my parents. Please, sorry, I'm saying this. I ask Allah to forgive my father and continue to bless my mother. May Allah continue to bless her and grant her good health, long life, good life. I ask Allah to give my mother and all our parents good lives here on earth. May Allah unite us together in Jannah. I ask Allah to bless all our malams who have set us right, who have gathered us to the way of the king, who have labored, labored over us so that we will not go astray. I ask Allah to reward them. I ask Allah to bless us through Allah Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ask Allah to reward Muhammad. I ask Allah to bless him and reward him. Continue to bless him. Because Rasulullah Muhammad tried his best. May Allah reward him. May Allah bless all the companions who stood by him against, against all odds. May Allah reward all the companions who lost their lives in the part of the faith. May Allah reward all of them who went through pain. May Allah reward all of them who went through challenges. Not for the sake of anything. They spent their money. They spent their time. They left their homes. They did hijrah. They left everything only for the sake of Allah. Oh Allah, bless all the companions of our Rasul. Oh Allah, bless all of them. Oh Allah, give us true Iman, Iman Yakin. So we might understand that this dunya is just nothing. And we might understand that Akhirah is the ultimate. Oh Allah, give us such Iman Yakin in our heart that we'll know that the ultimate is Jannah and that this dunya is nothing. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdu. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta mustaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Subhanu rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Salamun ala al-Musaleen. Alhamdulillah. Azakum Lao Karen said, thank you everyone. Thank you so, 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 so much. Sahara Collective and us all, the whole team of Sahara Collective is grateful to you all for joining. Thank you, Imam. Thank you so much for always coming through for us every single time. I ask Allah to continue to bless you in abundance and grant you beneficial knowledge. Thank you, Awa. Thank you all so much for joining today. Um, I hope that we all have a beautiful week. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.